Health literacy and research ethics. So what is health literacy? The World Health Organization describes health literacy as people and communities being able to access, understand, check and use information to make decisions about their health. People use these skills to decide whether or not to have life changing operations, but they also use them to decide whether to take part in research. Think about all the times you need people to understand information about your research. Recruitment posters, participant information sheets, dates and times for focus groups, online surveys, addresses for where to go for treatment, interview questions, consent forms and more. People need to be able to understand all these things to take part, but some people might find it more difficult than others. So who is affected by low health literacy? Some groups of people are more likely to have low health literacy than others. These are people who are older, from ethnic minority groups, people with English as a second language or who were born outside of the UK, people with lower qualifications or who were unemployed, people on a lower job grade or who earn less than £10,000 a year, people who don't own their own home or live in a deprived area, people who have a learning disability and people who have mental health problems. And in, in terms of numbers, it's about 64% of people across the North East who would find it hard to understand health information that contains words and numbers. How does health literacy affect research ethics? So it affects who you speak to. If information is written or spoken about in a complicated way, people are put off taking part. Those who do take part aren't representative of the population. It means you don't hear from groups who would benefit most um, and any kind of solutions that you design aren't designed for those who need them most. It also affects people's ability to take part. People may not turn up if instructions are, are too complex um, and what they say may not be reliable. If they don't understand what you've said, and they might be answering a different question or telling you what they think you want to hear. It also affects them giving permission or consent. If a consent form is too difficult to understand or written in a complicated way, people won't sign up to something that they don't understand, so they'll drop out. Or some people will say yes and sign up, in which case they're given uninformed consent, which has ethical considerations. What can we do to make things better? So for anything that people read, posters, participant information sheets, content forms, we need to use everyday language. So instead of saying something like, by not giving consent for any one element, you may be deemed ineligible for the study. You can say something like, if you do not take one of the boxes, you may not be able to take part in the study. We also need to use everyday language when we speak. So kind of over the phone during interviews. So we could say, instead of saying something like, we're conducting a study into, you could say, we're trying to find out if. Sometimes we give a lot of complicated information in one go um, and we might get to the end and someone might not have understood what we said right at the start, in which case you'll have to go back and explain everything again. Um, so a good technique to use um, to check understanding throughout is using chunk and check and teach back. So what we do when we use these techniques is break information down into small chunks and explain those chunks in simple words. Then after each chunk you check um, or get the person to teach back what they've understood. And what you're checking is if you have explained well enough, not whether they have remembered. So you can say something like, to check I've explained well enough, when you come back for the study, what do you expect to happen? Um, and if they're not sure, you've got the chance to explain it again in a different way. And finally, offer help. Um, filling in forms for people, writing things down to help people remember or suggesting ways to remind them to come back for interviews, like putting an alarm on their phone. Um, hi, so um, so Mrs Smith, nice to see you. 
My name's uh, Professor Rowlands, Jill Rowlands, and um, I'm about to start a study looking at a new tablet to treat blood pressure. And I understand you might be interested in helping us by taking part. Yes. Lovely. Okay, so may I tell you um, a bit about what we're doing? Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, what we're doing in the study is we've got this new tablet that we think is going to be very good for blood pressure and we want to see whether it works or not. So uh, if you take part, we, you would have a 50-50 chance of either getting the new tablet or getting a pretend tablet that would have no effect on you at all. And uh, those, um, both the tablets look the same, but neither you nor the researcher who's doing the study knows which type of tablet you're getting. It's called a randomised controlled trial and it's a really good scientific way of making sure that if we see a result that it's a, that it's a true result. Um, can I just, and that's called a randomised controlled trial. Can I check I've explained that well enough? Would you just explain that back to me? Yeah, so I think um, um, I'll either get um, the proper tablet or the pretend one um, and it's so that you can test whether the, the new tablet's working. Yeah, okay, good, that's good. So, um, obviously we want to check um, whether it's working, so everybody who takes part in the study comes up um, regularly to the clinic to have their blood pressure done and also to have some blood tests done so that we can look at the effect of the tablets um, on your body and that will take place uh, over about two years so um, I just again I just want to keep checking that I've explained it well enough could you just explain that back to me yes yeah, so um, we'll be getting our blood pressure uh, checked um, and then also some blood tests and um, over the two years. Yes, and why would we be doing the blood tests? Um, just to um, check your uh, kidneys are working. Yeah, properly. yeah, that's 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 exactly right. Okay, so um, I need to tell you about the risks of side effects with these tablets. We think they're pretty safe, um, but. There are rarely people who do suffer side effects, and by rare, I mean about one in um, to every 10,000 people. So sometimes it stops your kidneys uh, from working properly. Now, you wouldn't have any symptoms from that. That's why we do the regular blood tests when you come up to have your blood pressure done. The other rare side effect, again, about one in 10,000 people, is people can suddenly develop a, a severe allergic reaction to it. And what would happen then is you might notice a nasty rash, trouble with your breathing, you might get swelling of your face or your lips. If you got symptoms like that, you would need to seek immediate medical attention. So the safest thing to do is either to go to casualty or to ring 999 for an ambulance. As I've said, it is very rare, but it does happen sometimes, so it's something I need you to know about and look out for. So again, to check I've explained that properly, could you just say that back to me? Yeah, um, so I think it's, um, it might affect your kidneys, so you'll get regular blood tests mm -hmm. to check those, um, and you might have uh, an allergic reaction which you would need to, if you did, ring 999 or go to Yeah, uh, yeah, that's right, good. Okay, so um, so that's the, that's the study. Have you got, is there anything you'd like to ask me about what I've just told you or anything else about the study? Don't think so. No, Thank you. okay, lovely. So um, I'm going to give you a, a week to, to think it over and think if you've got any other questions, you can always write them down and bring them back with you. And then we'll meet this time next week, see if you've got any questions about it. Uh, if you have, we can talk about it. If you haven't, we can sign the consent form. The last thing to say is that it's completely up to you uh, whether you take part or not. If you choose not to take part or if you do join but then decide to withdraw to stop being part of the study 
it won't affect your care in any way. So it really is um, entirely your decision. Okay, thank you so much for thank coming. You. So, um, so now we're going to switch to the uh, less um, access accessible version of that. Okay, so uh, so good morning, Mrs. Smith. My name's Professor Rowland, and um, I'm just about to start um, a randomised controlled trial of a novel antihypertensive uh, treatment. Um, it's a double-blind randomised controlled trial um, and um, I understand you might be uh, interested in helping us um, is that right yes yes okay so um, the um, main thing to tell you about is that if you do take part we'd uh, need to monitor your renal function because uh, rarely there uh, is a side effect of affecting your renal function so we get you back to do uh, renal function tests and check your blood pressure about once every couple of months while you're in the study and the study will take place uh, for two years and then at the end of the study uh, we'll unblind the study so we'll know who's had the active agent and who's had the placebo. So um, did you understand what I just said? I don't think I know what by randomised and blind trial. Right, okay, well, um, uh, randomised uh, just means you've got an equal chance um, of uh, being in one group um, or the other. Um, and double blind just means that in order to avoid bias, neither you nor the researcher know uh, whether you're receiving the active agent or um, a placebo. Okay. Does that make it? Clearer? I think so. Yeah, okay. So um, I do need to tell you um, about um, some side effects uh, that happen really. So we've talked about the renal function and why we need to monitor it. Um, again, rarely people do get what we call um, anaphylactic uh, reaction to it. And if you've got an anaphylactic reaction. Um, in other words, you get a bronchospasm and, and facial swelling and an urticarial rash. If you had any of those, then you'd have to call 999 for an ambulance. So um, uh, is, that, is that okay? Did you understand that? I think so. Some of the terms are, I'm not clear on, but that's okay. Yeah, okay, all right then, lovely. So um, whether or not you choose to participate is entirely your decision. Uh, you can uh, withdraw at any time and it doesn't affect your medical care. So what we'll do is we'll uh, meet again in a week's time and um, you can tell me whether or not you consent to participation um, and then we'll get the paperwork done. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So, um, so thank you so much for taking part in that role play, Emma. And can I just ask you whether you noticed a difference between um, the two ways of explaining the study and, and if so, how they felt different? Yeah, there was a massive difference of uh, the, um, the use of medical terminology and jargon in the complex one was quite stressful and hard to follow. and. Um, makes it sound a bit more scary whereas the first first one uh, where it's clearly explained um it's much more easier to understand and um, you don't feel as frustrated or stressed by yeah. it so yeah there's a big difference and do you think that one approach might make you more or less likely to participate definitely yeah where it's explained fully and um, there's not as much jargon and you you understand exactly what you're going into that would make you want to participate mm -hmm. I would feel yeah even though some of the things we talked about were quite scary like anaphylaxis that still felt all right didn't yeah it? I think it's because it's explained in a way that you can understand it's less scary even though like you say it's a nasty side effect and serious side effect because it's explained in a way you understand 
it's less scary, definitely. Yeah. Okay, well, yeah. thanks very much again, and um, uh, we'll put this up on the website for researchers to see. Thank you.